The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Peter Clark. This is Ear to Asia. So look at North Korea. When Kim Jong-un announced the accomplishments of nuclear program within one and a half years, he met President Trump three times. He met President Moon Jae-in four times. He met President Xi Jinping four times, Putin. So with these nuclear weapons, he almost entered the first rankings of the world global players. In this episode, we talk with one of North Korea's top defectors. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. In August of 2016, North Korea's number two man at its London embassy made the bold decision to step away from his duties and the authoritarian embrace of his country to become one of Pyongyang's highest-ranking defectors. Until then, he was in the select company of North Korea's elite, having the privilege of an overseas education and enjoying an upward career trajectory in the diplomatic corps of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as North Korea is officially known. Now, residing with his family in South Korea and ever looking over his shoulder for vengeance from Pyongyang, Tae Yong-ho is devoting himself to communicating the need for wholesale political change in North Korea and an end to what he calls the slavery of ordinary North Korean people under the rule of Kim Jong-un. Tae Yong-ho's memoirs, titled Cryptography from the Third Floor Secretariat, were published in 2018 and quickly became a bestseller in South Korea. Tae Yong-ho is visiting Melbourne as a guest of Asia Institute and joins us now to share his unique insights into North Korean society and how it's been shaped by the Kim family. We'll also be exploring his views on North Korea's nuclear program, beyond Yang's relations with the US and China, and what a more positive future for the Korean peninsula might look like. Mr Tae, welcome to Ito Asia. Nice to meet you. And good to meet you as well. Let's start just by a very brief sketch of what that trajectory I referred to in the introduction, your personal diplomatic career, was actually like. I used the term elite a little moment ago. What was it like to be a member of the elite? Hmm. First of all, I was born in a very lucky family. Actually, my ancestors, my grandparents and my parents actually made a very good environment to be the elite of North Korean system. Actually, North Korea is the only country in 21st century where the population is divided into three main classes. So the first, uh, the ruling class is called core class, and the second is called a wavering class, which is the majority of North Korean people. And the third one is called hostile class. And I was lucky to be born in core class. Uh, that means that I could get a kind of privilege compared with the rest of the other people to get a good residence housing, to get a good education good job after the education. So in a bit, I was lucky. And then second thing, I worked very hard to be a good diplomat. And for instance, I passed a good examination to enter English school when I was 14. I learned a good English there. And later I was sent by the government to China to uh, study, which is really a privileged education uh, opportunity for me. So that's why, even though I was born in a good family, on the meanwhile, I worked very hard uh, to be the diplomat of North Korea. Hard work always helps, doesn't it? But you described a very good family. Take us further on how North Korean society is structured. I think it's called Songbun, is that right? Yes. The way you describe it, how does one find oneself in a particular class? First of all, I think uh, North Korea's a very peculiar system in the world. First of all, the actual idea which uh, controls uh, North Korea is a kind of, you know, hybrid from Marxism and also Confucianism. 
and a lot of you know, feudal elements inside. And even North Korean society copied some of the elements from a uh, Christian as well. So the idea which was produced by Kim Il-sung was called Suche. It is quite entirely a new different uh, idea. And on base of this idea, North Korea has created a quite a different social structures and political system apart from rest of the world. And even uh, North Korea's system is really peculiar, even among communist states. That term you used, we would probably translate as self-reliance. Is that right? But it's it's more complex than that, isn't it? Yes. That's, that's the tagline, if you like, right, the self-reliance. Yes. But its connotations go much deeper. That's right. For instance, North Korea is the only country in the world uh, which does not allow internet. And in North Korea, there is no any space for difference. The people are taught to believe only one ideology uh, which was instructed by the Kim family. For instance, if you have different viewpoints or political ideas, then you would be either arrested or even sent to prison camps or even worse, you would be the subject of instant persecution. So this is the system of North Korea. So it's a really a different system which the world uh, feels very difficult to understand. Is it like a feudal system, essentially, an hereditary feudal system? I would rather term it It's a kind of similar like dark age in European history. For instance, the people in North Korea do not have even freedom to move around. So Pyongyang is very well built and beautiful city. But if you want to live in Pyongyang, you should have very good songbun or good background of uh, your family, otherwise you can't live there. And if there is a job opportunity in Pyongyang, you can't even uh, move from your native place to Pyongyang. The people in North Korea are strictly constrained and they cannot even move around. And in schools or universities, the people are taught to learn only one ideology, not the others. In North Korea, it is a kind of society where the leader is depicted as the father of the family, while the Workers' Party of Korea is a mother of uh, North Korea. And the rest of the people are just treated as the minor of the family. So that's why when the leader is changed uh, from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-il, that means that, that the father is changed. And when the father is changed from Kim Jong-il to present Kim Jong-un, the father changes, but this kind of structure of mother and the minors are not changed. So it's a really peculiar feudal system. But on the meanwhile, the means of the productions are all socialized and nationalized. So in North Korea, you do not have even ownership of your apartments where you are living in. Uh, you don't have any ownership of property or land or whatever. So the people are deprived of any rights of the ownership. As a member of the elite, though, and certainly as a, a budding diplomat, you must have had more access to outside information, to more analytical type of education information. As that happened to you personally, were you aware of the beginning of disconnects in your own mind? Yes, I was posted in Denmark uh, firstly in 1996 uh, when I was 34 and that was my first post. But when I arrived in Copenhagen, I saw quite a different world uh, from which I was taught. I was taught in my uh, years of education that in capitalist world, the streets are full of beggars and homeless people. Uh, the capitalist mercilessly exploits its population. The riches get richer and the poor gets poor. But when I arrived in Denmark, I saw a very ample social welfare system. Their social welfare system was much better than North Korea's. But I was taught that North Korea is the only socialist paradise in the world. But I compared the Danish and North Korea. Danish was much better. That is the start of my confusion and even suspicion of North Korean system and the ideology and all of these things. A liberal city like Copenhagen in Denmark was, as a first posting, was quite an extraordinary one to create that sort of contrast. Let's go to 2016 when you finally did cross the Rubicon, actually defected. 
Could we describe it now in retrospect as a last straw moment or was there a build-up, an accumulation of dissent in your mind? Oh, it's a little bit a long process of evolution. I uh, was posted twice in London. I served uh, from 2004 to 2008 with my children and my last term was from 2013 until 2016. So in these two terms, not only... Uh, me, but my sons also, they entered to British uh, education. So when I served first in London, my first son was in high school. My second one was in primary school. Even though they had a British education, actually, they were young to understand the concepts of freedom, democracy, of all these things. But when I uh, went to London again in 2013, my second son was already in the last years of the high school, my first son was already in university. Now they start to understand and they start to compare the two systems and they ask me a lot of questions, you know, our private family dinner table, like uh, why there is no YouTube or internet system, why they fabricate all these, you know, false news to brainwash the people. So I have to be uh, very honest uh, to my sons. So... As long as I'm concerned, I actually endured all these uh, very conflicting beliefs in my mind. But when I saw that my sons learned these two different worlds when they were young, and every three or four years, my family switched from free and democratic world to most totalitarian world. And after another three or four years, we switched from the hell to paradise. So it always switched between freedom and totalitarian system. So at last, you know, how can I continue this kind of double life? And my sons are all grown-ups now. It could be very miserable for them to live in North Korea while they have already full knowledge of concepts of human rights, freedom, democracy, of all these things. So I really, you know, had really mercy on them. So if I do not cut off the chain of slavery at my generation, then my son and even further my grandchildren, they would uh, lead the same life as I did. So that's why I thought that as a father, it is my mission to cut off this chain of slavery at my generation. So now looking back and just looking at yourself today, loyalty as a concept, as a practice, sits right at the heart of the North Korean system. How do you view loyalty today as an idea and as a practice? A uh, North Korean system can only be in place by prevention of outside information to its people. Uh, this system can only be maintained by reign of terror. For instance, Kim Jong-un even uh, persecuted his uncle and his half-brother. Uh, so the people are just terrified in North Korea. So for North Korean citizens to show a kind of loyalty to the leadership is the matter of life and death. So that's why uh, there is no choice, but everyone should pretend to be loyal to the leader and the system. I guess most of us have imbibed all well to some degree. So we're imagining a society where people don't trust even their nearest and dearest. Is that the sort of society that you experienced early on? Yes, that's right. I didn't have that kind of problem with my wife because we spent together in European countries quite a long time as diplomat family. So my wife fully understood the freedom, democracy, and those uh, basic concepts of the free world. But the rest of the North Korean people, they were brainwashed in their times. And that's why they did not open their minds to their theorists and they're afraid of being reported to the security system by opening their minds to their nearest. So that's why in North Korea, the people actually, you know, do not open their uh, minds very easily to the other people. What's it like for a former North Korean living now in South Korea? For example, are you easily identified by your accent, your dialect? Do people pick you as a North Korean? I I am very careful and cautious because I am the number one of the assassination of North Korean regime. So I am really heavily protected. 
by South Korean uh, government. My freedom is very much uh, restricted. But on the meanwhile, I do understand that in order to let the rest of North Korean people enjoy the same freedom uh, as I'm enjoying, I have to do something. So I am very active in uh, South Korean worldwide uh, to persuade the South Korean population and the world to make a change in North Korea, said that North Korean people one day uh, will be finally freed from that kind of you know, tyrant and totalitarian system. Is there a mixture of responses to you personally within South Korea? Are some people angry with you in some ways, deeply mistrustful of you? Yes, many people in South Korea are angry uh, at me because South Korea is uh, very much polarized. The debate, a political debate between the right and the left are very severe. And some people in the left group think that the current North Korea could be the dream of the equality or whatever. So that's why North Korea, they uh, termed me as a human scum or traitor. So that's why some people in South Korea even uh, think that I'm the traitor of the socialist cause. What we're seeing at the moment in Hong Kong, which is quite extraordinary, is partially attributable to young people within the schools. They're having a much more liberal education than their counterparts on the mainland in China. Putting a spotlight on young people in North Korea, the millennials, if you like, what are they like? Is there any breakthrough just from their natural youthful interest in other things or are they so locked down by the process of propaganda and the ideological education in North Korea that they're not really thinking very outside the square? Oh, the current young generation in North Korea is quite different from their parents' generation. In North Korea, we call it a third generation of North Korean system. And this generation is called a Changmadang generation. The current uh, young generation uh, has not seen the peak of North Korea's socialist welfare system. I am different. When I was born and when I was in tens or twenties, I saw the peak of North Korea's socialist welfare system. When I was young or university student, the ration system was working. My family can make ends meet with my parents' salary. But the current North Korea is quite different. When I was in North Korea, uh, my monthly salary was only 0.3 US dollar. So with that month salary as a diplomat in Pyongyang, you can't even afford to buy one kilo of rice. So the whole population of North Korea are not dependent on the pay by the government. So that's why they look for a black market or Changmadang, capitalist market. So they have either two or three jobs. The society is very much corrupted. So young generation is looking for something new. That is the reason why, even though there is a very strong measures to prevent outside information, but still there is a massive smuggling of South Korean movies and dramas to young generations to North Korea. So the young generations in North Korea are really heavily suppressed by the system, but actually in their minds, the demand for a change, demands for information about the world is also growing. There are real comparisons, I guess, in everybody's minds as they listen to you with with the history of China too, with moving to that very capitalistic model, hyper-capitalism really, but still with total central command. Are there prospects in North Korea as you see it for that younger millennial generation who seem to be motivated by materialism and perhaps by some abstract notion of additional freedoms is it up to them now to force the pace towards that, that aspiration of capitalism? I think so. If we look back the communist world of the other countries, like what happened in Soviet Union or Eastern European countries, the changes were only available at a third generation. For instance, Gorbachev, uh, who brought the reform of Soviet system, he was the third generation. But if you look at North Korea, North Korean leadership... Kim Jong-un is the only one in 30s. He is the only one who belongs to third generation of North Korean system. Around him, 
the leaders who are the close associates of Kim Jong-un are still the second generation of uh, North Korean system. They if look you, like old men. That's right. If you look back to current China, Xi Jinping is the second generation of China's system. So it is very difficult to bring a kind of, you know, change when the second generation are in power. So that's why I'm looking forward to uh, days when the third generation of the system are in full power in every aspect. The images we receive from North Korea are very rare, very limited, very constricted, but we see almost a parody of support for the Supreme Leader. So, Mr. Tay, do you think the average North Korean actually supports the Supreme Leader or just tolerates him? First of all, our North Korean population has been leading under the current system for over uh, several decades. So they are used to this kind of daily routine of their lives. So it is really uh, hard to say whether they strongly believe in the leader or the system or not. But what is uh, very clear to them that the system could not solve any problems for them. That's why the black market and the capitalist elements are growing, even though the government and the regime are strongly oppose it. So these kind of two contradictions are meeting each other in North Korea. That's why I think when these third young generations grow up, and when they are in 30s or 40s and in power in every North Korean administrative, then I think they really want to make some changes, I think. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark with our guest, Tae Yong Ho, a former North Korean diplomat now living in South Korea. Let's throw the spotlight on this Kim dynasty. What conditions were right to allow a dynasty to emerge in the first place back in the 40s, I guess, and then flourish and grow and get such a tight grip on the North Korean people. Hmm. As I've said, Kim Il-sung clarified that North Korean population be divided into three classes. That is the system which Kim Il-sung copied from feudal Li dynasty of Korea. So if the population of the society is divided in this three major group of the society, then the core class, I mean the leading class of that uh, society always are interested in maintenance of the system because they receive uh, privileges and economic benefit. So that is how Kim family succeeded in that kind of uh, dynasty system. What are the rough percentages of those three classes? The core class is around from 15 to uh, 20%. And the hostile class is ar- around 15 to 20% as well. And the majority is the wavering class. The trick is that Kim family gives a kind of you know opportunity to go up to wavering classes. So there is a very strong competition or contest inside the wavering class to get rid of their class to reach the core class. So some of them want to be extremely loyal. But on the meanwhile, when if you fail to be loyal to Kim family from core class, then you would be immediately expelled from core class to the hostile class. So in North Korea, there is continuation of successive persecution among core class. So when Kim Jong-un persecuted the cadres from the leaderships, their families are either sent to prison camps or the remote countryside. So these kind of, you know, frequent changes inside core class and within class is one of the ways to keep the society going on. But the question is how long Kim Jong-un rely on this kind of, you know, the control system. Kim Jong-un was not the eldest son. How did he attain power? As I've said, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il had already made that kind of system in advance. They think that the Kim family is the only one who can tell the truth, who can see the future of North Korea. So inside North Korea, people regard the member of Kim family as a god. So when Kim Jong-il appointed his last son to be the successor, actually there was no any strong or open protest, you know, for this kind of continuation. And the system in North Korea, there's no any free election. There is no opposition. So if one 
person of supreme leader decides, then everyone is expected to follow. So this is the system how it works. So Kim Jong Un has become the successor of North Korea without any opposition from the system, from the leaders, or even inside the family. Did you anticipate some changes, some improvements, even in the way North Korea was led when he took power? Yes. I had really great expectation. He was educated in Switzerland. I thought that he knew a lot of、uh, Western culture, democracy, and human rights. As the third generation of Kim family, he may try to make some changes in North Korea. So not only me, but my colleagues as well. They had really high expectations. But our and my expectations are faded away when he decided to continue the line of. Finishing the nuclear program of his grandfather and his father in March of 2013. So Kim Jong Un has chosen the policy of continuation and tradition rather than change. And Kim Jong Un knows very well that if he tries a kind of reform or change in North Korean system. Which is a little bit different from what his grandfather or his father did, then it could really risk、uh, his control over North Korean society. So that's why not only me but the people's expectation on him、uh, started to fade away. What is the greatest threat to his dictatorship? I think the greatest threat was the legitimacy. To be the next、uh, leader of North Korea, North Korea is very. Confucius a society, so it is a kind of you know long established concept that if someone、uh, succeeds the family business, then it should be the first son of the family. But Kim Jong Un is the last son of the family. But North Korean people do not know that there was a first son Kim Jong Nam, there was second son Kim Jong Sol. Nobody knows because these children of Kim Jong Il were kept. Totally secret inside North Korea, but Kim Jong Un knows, and the high rankings of the leadership knew that he was the last son. So that is his most, I think, a dilemma. North Korean newspaper always say that he is the only successor of Park Bloodline, but is he? No. That was the first and biggest threat to his leadership when he came to power at the first few years. One can only imagine what the jostling, the rivalries are like within the military elite in North Korea. What is the bedrock reason why they continue their loyalty and support of Kim Jong Un? First of all, I think it is worth to notice that there is a frequent change of highest-ranking generals in North Korea. Every year, the highest rankings of North Korean generals are changed from one post to that post. So this proves that Kim Jong Un still has a great fear of these、uh, army generals, and these army generals are under very heavy surveillance system. Even the army generals even can't carry a pistol with them. They were afraid of being prosecuted at any moment. For instance, the former. Chief of General Staff of North Korean Army was persecuted. The Defense Minister of North Korean Army was persecuted. So these army generals in the top rank knew quite well that they could be the next instant subject of persecution. So everyone is afraid. That's why they want to pretend or even show the highest level of loyalty to Kim Jong Un in order to survive. What's Kim Jong Un like as a man? Oh, in a word, he is intelligent, but also merciless.、Uh, he was educated in Switzerland, so he understands very well the influence of the media in democratic world. Meanwhile, he knows how to use the power of terror. Whenever he feels any kind of you know threat, he immediately act to remove that threat. You know. From his side, so he is a man、uh, with intelligence and also boastfulness. Which intelligence apparatus do you believe has the deepest coverage? North Korea on 
Donald Trump or Donald Trump's intelligence apparatus on North Korea? I think North Korea has more strong intelligence information about Trump. And North Korea is a closed society. That's why it is very difficult and read what's going on inside North Korea. But from North Korea's uh, perspective, uh, America is very easy to be read. All newspapers are saying, all politicians are saying, all experts are saying. So for North Korea, it is very easy to make a plan with the President Trump, while actually America does not have any detailed information about Kim Jong-un and its regime. So when Kim Jong-un invited Donald Trump to cross the border in that last meeting, he knew he'd come. Of course, because uh, if we see North Korea compared with China, North Korea is exactly following the steps of the former Chinese uh, leaders did. For instance, China want to make an equal relationship with America in 50s and 60s, but America never accepted China as a global player. So Mao Zedong, he succeeded in hydrogen bombs in 1967. And it took only two years for Americans to change their policy. So in 1969, then President Nixon, he announced a Nixon doctrine, which actually accepted the China as a, a global leader. And President Nixon visited China in 72. He stepped his first foot on China only when China succeeded in nuclear bombs. So look at North Korea. With these nuclear weapons, Kim Jong-un entered Premier League with the help of President Trump. Kim Il-sung tried very hard to be equally treated by Americans but failed. Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, he tried very hard to invite American presidents to the summit, but American presidents only visited North Korea after they retired from their presidency. Jimmy Carter, Clinton were visited, but when they were just a normal person. But when Kim Jong-un announced the accomplishments of nuclear program in November of 2017, within one and a half period of time, he met President Trump three times. He met President Moon Jae-in four times. He met President Xi Jinping four times, Putin. So with this nuclear weapons, he almost entered the first rankings of the world global players. Is that the reason that Kim Jong-un is so obsessed with long-range ballistic missiles? Yes, that's right. He thinks that if he only relies on short or medium missiles, he cannot enter that Premier League. Only the countries with nuclear and ICBMs can enter the Premier League. We've seen the public bromance between Kim Jong-un and President Trump of the United States, and we've seen the kabuki of their gatherings uh, in North Korea or in South Korea in the demilitarized zone there. How do you assess the actual versus the apparent concessions made by either side to the other? I haven't seen any concessions from Kim Jong-un, but I saw great concessions from American side. First, North Korea has got this nuclear and ICBM over one year and a half, but uh, America has not even escalated its economic sanctions against North Korea. America is still signaling that they are ready for any kind of dialogue with North Korea. America president said that denuclearization of uh, North Korea would take uh, quite a long time. He is not in hurry to make any denuclearization uh, process uh, happening in the near future. So actually, North Korea succeeded in buying time with these nuclear weapons. And to my impression, President Trump is not actually interested in denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. He is only interested in re-election of his presidency. And he is looking for any kind of you know opportunity to make a very good use of these North Korean nuclear issues for his second presidency. There was real contrast in the comments between Donald Trump and Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan at the G7. In fact, there was complete disagreement, really, in, in rhetorical terms. Japan, where do they fit into all this? 
Japan is very near to North Korea. So North Korea's short and intermediate nuclear missiles are direct to Japan. But those remarks from President Trump's in the last few months were really a surprising because President Trump's indicated that as long as North Korea keeps on moratorium on ICBM, then it's okay. That means America had already drawn a new red line which tells to North Koreans that as long as you do not uh, threat America, then it's okay. That means what about then America's allies' security in Northeast Asia, like countries like Japan or South Korea? So that's why I think uh, Prime Minister Abe is a little bit upset of these kind of uh, attitudes by President Trump. How do you see the relationship between North Korea and China today? Is Xi Jinping actually the puppet master? I think... China now feels a more intensified American threat in this region. But on the meanwhile, vice versa. America is not happy with growing Chinese power in this region as well. So in the long-term strategy, China regards North Korea as a kind of pumper zone to check and prevent the escalation of American power in this region. And how can China make North Korea as kind of pumper zone? They think that nuclear weapon can contribute to some extent to keep the current uh, North Korean system to play as a kind of bumper zone for China. So that's why China is not enthusiastic in carrying out those economic uh, UN sanctions, which China promised to do. Can peace come to the Korean Peninsula, as we imagine it anyway, without China? I think it's uh, really difficult because when there is strong pressure and when North Korea is pushed to tight corner, always China uh, reaches out its hand of help. So if China continues to play this kind of game in the context of playing game with Americans, then I think it's really difficult to bring any true solution of denuclearization of North Korea. How can North Korea exist without China? Uh, It's almost impossible because North Korea is the only one country in the world which heavily relies on one country. 95% of North Korea's foreign trade only relies on China. So if China cuts off these uh, trade relations with North Korea, North Korea cannot survive. How do you assess the current attempts at rapprochement from South Korea towards North Korea? So far, rapprochement didn't work very well. For instance, in the last August, Kim Jong-un conducted even five times of short-range missiles. And Kim Jong-un was uh, not happy with the current South Korean government's policy of sanctions. And on the meanwhile, uh, South Korean government wants to improve its relations with North Korea, but they are tied by the framework of UN sanctions. So there is really uh, very little that South Korean government can do for inter-Korean relations. Let's think future now. Firstly, the reshaping of North Korea itself. There are models in the region, aren't there, for a shift to more capitalism, etc. Do you anticipate that may eventually emerge either during the dictatorship of Kim Jong-un or beyond? Kim Jong-un is looking for a kind of new model of future North Korea's economic structure. He does not want to copy the Chinese or Vietnam style, but he wants to copy kind of isolated and restricted a special economic zone style, which is now in place in DMZ Kaesong area. And Kim Jong-un has already announced that he would develop 14 special economic zones inside North Korea. And now Kim Jong-un is building tourist resort in Kalma Peninsula near to Wonsan City, which is totally isolated from the rest of North Korea. So he wants to make a kind of, you know, isolated special economic zones in some part of North Korea and let foreign investments in so that he can earn foreign currency with the help of cheap North Korean labor force. Mr. Tay, in your view, what are the greatest challenges to bringing North and South Korea together? I think, first of all, South Korean politics must approach a very honest 
policy towards North Korea. Nowadays, the North Korea in South Korea is too much polarized. So that's why uh, South Korean government cannot exert its strength to make a change inside of North Korea. And then second thing, I think uh, the world should try to disseminate much information inside North Korea. I think education is the most important thing for the North Korean population. We should uh, smuggle in more information about the world, the new concepts of freedom and democracy so that the people inside North Korea must be educated. Otherwise, you see, if they are staying in the current brainwashing system of North Korea, then we can't expect any change. Final question, and it's a personal one. Taking you back to 2016 when you stepped off the cliff and looking back today, what are your deepest regrets? Oh, my deepest regrets is that I could not tell in advance about my plan to my dear friends and my relatives uh, in North Korea. For instance, you know, I couldn't tell my secret plan of my defection even to my friends working together in my London embassy. And I couldn't tell my plan to my nephews or cousins. If I told them in advance, they could have very well good preparations. But North Korea, you know, you can't tell this kind of secret plans even to your theorists. So actually my defection brought a lot of uh, sacrifice to my dear friends and relatives, and I really do regret for that. And the price you've paid, of course, is that daily apprehension, I suppose, of assassination. How do you deal with that daily? Oh, first of all, I, whenever I move around or whenever I walk the streets, whatever, I make some disguise like, you know, what I did, these camps and then the sunglasses. I seldom talk with the people passers by. I have a little bit different North Korean accent. Uh, so I have to be very cautious and careful not to be seen by the people. And I always, you know, uh, move around, meet my bodyguards. Uh, I try my best. Mr. Tay, we appreciate your being with us today on Ear to Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest this time, Tay Yong Ho, the former North Korean diplomat who defected to South Korea in 2016. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or SoundCloud. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And of course, let your friends know about us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 3rd of September 2019. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2019, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark. Thanks for your company.